Whoa, Jesus, I see you for all that you've done for me. So good to be here with you today. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Conan. I'm the Creative Arts Student Ministry Director here at Victory Lutheran Church, and they have turned the reins over to me this Sunday, so buckle up. It's going to be fun. Um, we have a few announcements, I think. Uh, announcements, announcements. Uh, first off, we wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone that came out. Uh, I believe it was last Saturday. It, everything's kind of blending together right now, but I think it was last Saturday. And uh, they did a lot of work around here, hedging up, hedging the hedges, spraying stuff. Yeah, go ahead and grab a seat. I'm sorry. That was my bad. <laughs> um, but seriously, a huge thank you to all those that came out for the work day. What a blessing. And it was a little bit of fun, too. I think uh, for those of us that were out there, we had a little fun. I had fun. I got to spray bugs and clean the workroom. And it looks really awesome. If you go back there, let me know. Just kidding. Um, what else we got? Oh, yes. June 19th through the 22nd, VBS is happening. Who's excited for that? I know I am. We have, I think, like 50 kids or something like that. I can't remember where we're at. But we have a lot of kids signed up this year, which is exciting. Uh, we have leaders coming out from iPoint. I'm not sure who's coming out. Maybe a Joel Bowman. I don't know. I'm hoping. That'd be kind of fun. Um, and then, yeah. What else we got? Is that it? Wow. They weren't kidding when they said uh, there's not many announcements in the summertime. Um, let's do our call to worship. So our call to worship today comes from Psalm 100. Is that right? 100. 100, verse 3 through 5, which says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. 
and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's continue worshiping the Lord this morning. Would you stand with me if you're able? that time in our service, go ahead and grab a seat for this part, uh, where we, uh, we just come before the Lord, and uh, 
we think about this past week, maybe some areas where we could have struggled, maybe didn't get it all right, maybe we didn't treat our spouse or our, our siblings or our parents very, very good. And um, we can just come before the Lord today, and we get to confess that to him. But that's between you and God. So this time, we're just going to pray um, just a quick prayer. And then, uh, yeah, we'll just pray. Um, so let's just spend a couple minutes here just in silence as we confess our sins to the Lord. Father God, we just come before you this morning in awe of who you are, in awe of the work that you've done for us, God. We acknowledge, God, that we cannot do anything on our own power to absolve or to pay for the sins that we've committed, God. But God, your word promises us that those who confess and repent of their sin, God, that you're faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. So God, will we we just rest into that promise today, lean into that this morning, and believe that to be true because your word says it. It wasn't a man that said it, God, but it was you that said that. We love you. In Jesus' name. Today's scripture reading comes from Ephesians verse 1, 16 through 21. And it says this, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And it's incomparably great power for us who believe that power is the working of his mighty strength, which, is, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every life or every title that can be given not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. What a great promise that we have there in that text. Would you stand with me if you're able as we continue to worship the Lord in response to the work he's done? built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. built 
I'm nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ unknown, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love, and through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. service where uh, we typically make time to give back to God our tithes and our offerings. And if you're joining us here today for the first time, we don't want you to feel like you have to put anything in that 
that offering bucket. We are just so glad that you would choose to be here with us on this Sunday. And uh, we just hope that you would come again so we can get a chance to get to know you, get to, get to meet you, hear your story. But for those of us that call Victory home, this is our opportunity to give back to God what he's given to us first and foremost. So out in the narthex, you'll see a little basket right in the middle there. If you want to drop that off there during the meet and greet time or on your way out, whatever you need to do, um, feel free to make use of that. And then uh, yeah, let me pray for this morning's offering. Father God, we are just so in awe of the work that you do, God. God, we pray that you would use these gifts, these, these offerings, these tithes, God, to just further your kingdom. God, not only here in Jamestown, North Dakota, but in places all over the world, God. Places all over this country. God, we just commit this service to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to take a few moments. Man, there's, a, there's quite a few new phases I'm seeing here. Uh, take a moment, go greet somebody you didn't come here with today, and then uh, we'll find our seats here in just a few moments and get started. All right. I love seeing the fellowship that we have here. This is one of my favorite parts of this church.
I'll strategically use the silence. There we go. Oh, we have King's Kids. I didn't see you earlier. Okay. If you are a student, I can't remember the age range, but if you're just a student that wants to go to King's Kids, we have uh, Maddie and somebody else going with her. Is it Jadrian? And Olivia. All right. King's Kids, you are dismissed. Have a great time. They've been having a lot of fun the last couple weeks. If you get a chance, do me a favor. When you see Maddie or any of the, the, the leaders for King's Kids, would you just give them some encouragement? Because they, they do such a wonderful job with those kids. I think it was like two weeks ago. They had a birthday party for the church because it was Pentecost Sunday. And I didn't even remember that. So I was like, whoa. I'm on staff at this church. I should probably know when Pentecost Sunday is happening. But I stand corrected. And I loved it. They had a great time. Um... I'm just going to jump right into this. I wasn't planning this uh, when I originally was going through my text. I was trying to figure out how I could take everything in John chapter 9 and condense it down to like two verses. And uh, I don't think it's possible. And so to give you guys the the full context of where we're going to be at today, I'm going to just read a, a section of John chapter 9 to you just so we can have some clarity on where we're going to be. So John chapter 9 begins like this. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Let's remember that one for later. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with his saliva and put it on the man's eyes. And then he tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, this word Siloam means sent, as in he's sending you. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. It's pretty amazing. Now, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was. And others said, no, he only only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. And he told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Well, let's bring in the Pharisees now. Chapter, uh, verse 13 picks up here. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Now, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. And they turned against, or excuse me, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say uh, was born blind? How is it that he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. 
His parents said this because they were afraid. Afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know is I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? And I think at this point he must be getting kind of frustrated because he's just repeating himself over and over. He answers in verse 27, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we do not even know where he comes from. And this man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. I'm going to stop here. So we begin today realizing that the story is really all about blindness. It was the physical blindness of the beggar that caught the disciples' attention, and the disciples, upon seeing this man, asked Jesus a question and want him to teach them. They believed that the blindness of this man happened because some sin that he had committed. and They were unable to see what was about to happen. We find two types of blindness here in this John chapter 9 text. We have the physical blindness of the beggar and the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees and even the disciples. I can't imagine what it would be like to be blind. To not be able to see uh, the face of my wife, to read a book or watch a movie with my friends and family, uh, to do simple tasks like walking down the street without some sort of help, whether it be a stick or somebody guiding me, to see a sunrise over the Cascade Mountains, or to watch a beautiful sunset over the North Dakota Prairie. I can't imagine living life completely in the dark. Can you? But there's something else out there that's much worse than the physical blindness. It's spiritual blindness. Not knowing where your life is going. Not knowing if you're right with God not knowing if you're going to heaven when you die. You see, spiritual blindness is much more tragic than physical blindness. And today in our text, we will see how Christ deals with spiritual darkness. The light of Christ has no limit to where it can go. It peers into the deepest chambers of darkness and exposes a person. Now, when this happens, a person will either turn and come into the light or turn and go away from the light. I titled today's message, Christ is the Unlimited Light. And my first point being, Christ is the unlimited light that exposes the darkness 
And we're going to see a few different things when we, when we unpack this. The first thing is the disciples of Jesus were blinded by judgment. So what did the disciples say when they walked up to the man? You remember back in the beginning of that text, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Now, before we go any further, I think it's necessary to say that this was kind of a common belief among Jews of the day, that if you were born with a, some kind of illness or disease, that this was just typical. I mean, as a matter of fact, it was widely taught that God had punished sinners. God punished people for the sin. And that punishment came in the form of some sort of sickness or disease. So for the disciples to ask question, that question in particular, was not out of the ordinary. But however, in order to ask a question like that, you have to believe or think a few things about yourself. The first being, if sin caused things like that, then you must be all right with God because you're all right. Now, the second thing you might think is, if someone had something wrong with them, then they must not be all right with God. But what happens when we begin to think that way? Well, we begin to think that we're better than other people. You know, we may not believe that when someone has something wrong with them today that God is punishing them or their parents. We've been educated to know that sickness and disease for the most part is just a natural, natural cause of sin in general. Not merely a punishment for personal sin. However, I do think that we are sometimes blinded by judgment. You see, the disciples saw in the blind man a theological debate, whereas Jesus saw in the blind man someone whom the work of God could be made known. Are you tempted to judge? When you see a teenage mother struggling to raise her child alone, are you tempted to say, well, she should have just waited till marriage? Or when you see the effects of uh, alcoholism or drug addiction on the lives of the people around you, are you tempted to say, well, they don't really deserve any better because of their choices? When we think that way, do we really care about the blind in our community or the blind in our world? You know, it's so much easier to sit back and debate the theological ramifications of bad decisions that other humans make. And it's much harder to see how you can make a difference in the lives of people who are hurting because of a bad decision that they or someone else had made for them. It's much easier to just judge than to heal. We should not let judging others blind us from the fact that we are to be instruments of healing and not finger pointing. What would happen if instead of condemning the teenage mother, the church would offer help and encouragement and ensure that she knows the love of Jesus? What would happen if instead of shaking our heads in disgust at the alcoholic or the drug addict, that the church would instead come alongside these people and offer help and point them to the hope and the true source of salvation that can't be found at the bottom of a bottle or in the high that you get off drugs. I mean, I've tried, and you won't find it there. Now, the second thing we see is the neighbors were blinded by skepticism. What happened when the man returned to the people who knew him? Well, the first thing we see is some didn't even believe it was him. While others would just demand him to tell him or tell them over and over how this had happened. The neighbors and those around were skeptical of what had happened. And they remembered this man as being a blind beggar at the temple gate. And now he's up walking around. 
And I'm sure some of them wondered for the rest of their lives, was he really blind? Or has he been doing this in order to be a beggar? How many of us have been there? How many of us have driven driven past somebody on the side of the road with a sign thinking the same thing? I know I have. Now, how many of us in here this morning struggle with skepticism? I'm not going to ask you guys to put your hands up or anything like that, but I know I do. And then when God does do a miracle, the skeptic becomes jealous. And let's be honest, it's really our jealousy that keeps us from doing the evangelism and the reaching out to our neighbors. Now Romans 1, verse 16 and 17 says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith first from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Through the power of God, this man's life was changed forever. The same thing can happen today if God's people will quit being skeptical of the power of the gospel and preach it to everyone we come in contact with. What would happen if God's people everywhere would stop being a skeptic? Now the third thing we're going to see is the Pharisees were blinded by their religion. Which begs the question, what is religion? Religion is a system of beliefs, but and with that in mind, almost anything could be a religion. But what happened when the Pharisees were confronted with the man who was born blind but now sees? Well, the first thing we see is they debated the fact that the man was blind at all. And the second thing we see is they said Jesus must be a sinner because he healed on the Sabbath. Which I find kind of humorous if you think about it. Like That's a serious reach, if you ask me. The man performed a miracle, helped this man, healed this man. But because he did it on the day off, the day of rest, oh, he's a, that's wrong. Seems kind of silly, right? I think so. And you know, it's easy to sit back and point the finger at the Pharisees for using their traditions and religion to remain blind to the work of God. However, I contend that the same thing can happen to us. We in Christian churches and in the churches of Christ can make the same mistake the Pharisees made. We can rely on our traditions and heritage to get us through. If the blind people in this community started coming to this church and caused you to ask some serious questions about the way things have always been done, would you care more about the people or the traditions and heritage of the church? Jesus condemned the the Pharisees and the Sadducees many times in his preaching and teaching. Why? Because they were more concerned about their traditions and religion than they were with God. Let me say it like this. They were more concerned about the paint on the walls or the carpet on the floor than they were about the soles of the feet that were tracking the mud in. They were more concerned with the status quo. I think that point was beautifully illustrated in the movie Jesus Revolution when they were making such a big deal about all these people walking in barefoot off the street and the elders were like, we just have new carpet. It's going to dirty the carpet. So what did the pastor do? He got down on his hands and knees and started washing their feet as they entered. How many of us would be willing to do something like that? Now, the fourth thing we see is the parents' man, or the man's parents, 
or blinded by fear. When the Pharisees wanted answers, they, they were not getting from the man himself. They called his parents in. But how did they respond? Well, they really wanted no part of it. But why? Because they were afraid. Now, what were they afraid of? They were afraid of being thrown out of their synagogue. They were afraid of being cast out of their community. Fear is a crippling agent. Fear keeps us from experiencing the work of God completely. Not only in our personal walks with Jesus Christ, but in our corporate walk with Jesus as well. Now I ask, what would happen if God's people and God's churches stopped being fearful? And many times when something good starts happening in the church, the church will become scared of the spiritual gifts because the church can't control them. The first thing we can see is lives would be changed because we would no longer fear rejection or persecution because of the message of Christ. The second thing we would see is churches would be living on the edge of faith, using every dollar they had to make a difference for the cause of Christ. What happens is we become fearful that God won't provide a way, so we don't try to talk to the neighbor or try the new program that the church is offering Guys, don't be blinded by fear. The Bible is clear as to the type of fear that we should have. I mean, listen to what the writer of Proverbs has to say. He says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When we fear the Lord, we won't fear anything else, and we will step up and step out in faith. Let me ask you guys this. Today are you... Are you feeling under conviction because the light of the world exposes you of judgment, skepticism, religious pride, fear? What now? You've been exposed. Well, the Word of God would call us to repent of the spiritual blindness that separates us from God and to cry out through the Son of Man who is the light of the world. Which brings me to my last point. Christ is the unlimited light that reveals the light. What do I mean by that? Just as in verse 7, Jesus sent the blind man to wash, in verse 4, God sent Jesus to us. He's the pool of Siloam. Jesus is our pool of Siloam. God's been seeing into the deepest part of your sin today. And when Jesus, the light of the world, exposes your sin, listen to what he says here in verse 37. This is Jesus' words here for you. You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. Hear me when I say this. And know this is coming from Jesus. You are clean. You are washed. You are set free. You are forgiven. You are clothed. You are anointed. You are blessed. And you are a child of God. Amen. Father God, um, We just thank you so much. We're in awe of the work that you do for us. God, thank you for being the unlimited light that just reveals and exposes us, God, so we can confess to you. God, would you just continue to do your work here in this place today? In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a time now to respond. Um, I think it's very fitting we end with this song. We're going to do uh, Amazing Grace. Just give us a second here to get transitioned over here.
How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. In grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear? The hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. In like a flood, His mercy reigns. that just be the cry of our hearts today. God, we are so in awe of just your amazing grace, God. That you would make a blind wretch like me be able to see. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So good to worship with you today, church. Be blessed. Enjoy the sunshine out there if you get the chance. It's beautiful. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you all.